thank you for today. Thank you for your presence with us as we study calculus. I just pray your blessing on our understanding and your anointing on Scott as he presents the material that uh, your presence, we feel it strong and you help us to uh, understand uh, the beauty of your organizational schemes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm going to hold it. If I'm going to hold you to a standard of excellence, I will hold myself to a standard of excellence as well. I will have all of your names memorized. Okay? So let's see. Tell me if I miss one. So Danny, Michael, Axel, Sam, Beverly, Dr. Harder, <laughs> Colby, Diego, Chloe, Bella, Marissa. It's, do you go by Isabel or Isabel? Bella. Okay. Yeah. What do you call me? TV. <laughs> Dania, Rebecca, Jacques, Prem, and it was in, it was it, it had an edgy, like a g. how was it spelled again? Agnel. Agnel. Let's go. Agnel. Agnel. And then remind me, I you were in linear. Yeah, sure. Oh, right, Stephen. Hard worker. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, real quick before we start, I want to establish this off the get go. Okay, so we have in this class we have one goal, and we're gonna get there with one means. Okay, so I want you guys to internalize this because if you don't internalize this in college, um, well, good luck really getting through your senior year. So the goal is to glorify God. I don't care what you're doing. You're studying calculus three, and you're definitely not doing it for fun. So you need a reason outside of yourself to be learning some difficult mathematics. So the goal, if I ask, I say one goal, and you're going to say glorify God. So what is our one goal? Glorify God. God. Okay, we're going to get there through one means. And that one means is going to be, well, let's see, how do I put this? It's going to be excellence through obedience. Okay? If you obey God, you're going to do some excellent work. Okay? Now, you can't do it on your own, so that's why I want to emphasize that part. You can't do it on your own, but the reason that nobody can, okay? So, what's our one goal? Glorify God. And then our one means is going to be excellence through obedience. Through obedience. Okay, speaking of obedience, let's see if everyone's going to lie about this right off the bat. Who actually did the readings over the weekend on the UGL? Over the weekend. Yeah. I like I said at the end of class on Friday, I'm gonna ask a question related to something that would be in the readings, and then we'll get a general sense of how people are doing. Okay. These aren't designed to be trick questions, but legitimately, I want you to be getting this kind of stuff out of the readings. So if I have points, P x1, y1, z1, and q, x2, y2, z2. Recognize these as points in how many dimensions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I'm going to write down a formula and you're all going to tell me what this actually represents. The change of x squared, change of y squared, change of z squared, all under the house. That's like to find the magnitude, right? Magnitude. 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 This is very good, yes. Yeah. If you said either magnitude or distance, that is exactly, yeah. the formulas are the same. So when geometry, the distance between two points is just the same as the length of the vector, because that vector, like you saw earlier from P to Q, is the same thing. So very, very, very good. Okay. Um, today is 13.3, so we're going to do all things dot products. And I'm going to highlight a little bit of the cross products as well, um, because they really should be understood together. If you understand them together, you will have a better you have a better chance of remembering how all of the concepts kind of mesh together uh, um, versus just blank memorizing. Uh, on that formula, uh, in the reading, uh, it showed something different. It showed um, x two minus x one. Y2 minus Y1, et cetera. Oh, yeah, and then it did Z by itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same. In general, this is actually, that's a good question. I'll just bring this up right now. In general, if we see a delta next to any variable, say X, it doesn't matter what this is. This is going to automatically imply you take the one that's after minus the, the, the difference between two. So that's just kind of a convention. 
I'm often very lazy to, I don't like writing out more symbols than I need. So consistent helps with memory and with practice as well. Okay. You guys are all engineers. I'm not gonna lie to you. You already have seen dot products. You've already seen cross products, okay? So what I'm gonna show you is what's going to be important for Calc 3. I draw up these concepts. So we're gonna look first at the concept and then I'll get you to your beloved application. So I have fun for the first week class, then you have fun for the second half class. And it's a, a little bit of a compromise there. Okay, so here's two vectors. And it doesn't really matter what these are. And then there is an angle between them. I'm sure you've all seen that too many times. So here is how we define the dot product. So u dot v, as you probably have already done, is the magnitude of u, the magnitude of v, and sine or cosine goes here. Uh, cosine. cosine. So cosine theta. And then here's the thing. The dot product is going to be a scalar. The cross product is not a scalar, it's a vector. So really, we're talking about that. We're going to talk about first the magnitude of this cross product. So that's why, that's what this is for. So this is a scalar, and to make this a scalar, we need the magnitude of it. But it's going to be very, very similar construction, right? It's just u, v, instead of cosine, is what? Sine. Okay. So here's what I'm going to point out to you. Cosine and sine act in this interesting sibling relationship on the unit circle. So this is a, I want you to think of the dot product as a measure of alignment. I want you to think of the cross product as kind of like, like a tale of two cities. You've got measure of alignment, and then you get measure of orthogonality. Orthogonality. There is a 50% chance that I made that word up, um, but <laughs> it, it expresses the idea that orthogonal is right angle. This is a measure of how perpendicular something is. This is a measure of how parallel they are. Now, here's the intuition for this. What is the cosine of zero? So if I were to have my two vectors kind of laying on top of each other, so this is u and this is v, what's theta here? Zero. zero. Right. So, so it's theta is zero. I use radians, by the way. I'll clarify that. So if you see something, it'll be in radians, never in degrees. Um, I'm sorry, but radians are correct and degrees are not. <laughs> I can't believe I record these things to my computers. Very incriminating for the future. Okay, so you thought <laughs> if I'm to plug in theta is zero into here, right? We're gonna have u times v. Now, what's the cosine of zero? One. Okay, yeah. So if I multiply this by one, does that change? No. Oh. Okay, straightforward. So that is the maximum possible value you'll get. And funnily enough, this is the this is the most aligned these two vectors are going to be. The most aligned two vectors can be if they are parallel, and that's where we get a maximum dot product. So when we're looking to maximize dot products, that is what it means to have uh, to the parallel vectors. So in, in higher mathematics, we don't always use this form. We might ask this form to get to this information. So if you were asked, okay, if you have show that these two vectors are parallel. Well, you might think to yourself, huh, if they're parallel, theta has to be zero. Maybe I can see what the dot product is. And if it's maximized, there you go. Um, uh, the magnitude of the cross product, though, is going to be a little bit different. So the magnitude of the cross product is going to be my u times v. Now, what's the sign of zero? Uh, zero. zero. So I'm multiplying these two scalars by zero. So what's a scalar times zero gonna be? Zero. Interesting. So as a measure of alignment, the dot product is a measure of alignment and it's maximized when we're perfectly aligned. As a measure of orthogonality, to have completely parallel vectors, that's like the opposite you can get from being orthogonal to each other. So does it, does it really surprise us that a, the magnitude of that cross product is zero when we're perfectly aligned? That's the opposite of what we wanted. We want it to be orthogonal. So the measure of orthogonality is completely zero if they're parallel. Okay? 
Yes. So orthogonal means like parallel or what is that? Ah, oh, good question. So a line is going to be parallel. So I'll okay. get up here. So this will be parallel. In one sense, and this will be um, orthogonal, so like right angle. So right angle is orthogonal, perpendicular, all of those words refer to the same thing. Yes. So is it correct to say for the second example that it is full alignment and no orthogonality? Correct. Right. It's fully aligned, and there is no level of orthogonality. Now, this obviously has a little bit of a mixture of things right. going on here, because it's not completely, is it more aligned or is it more orthogonal? Well, that becomes yeah. subjective. And so that's where you would compute with whatever the function is going to be. We do know that cosine is going to decrease as theta increases in that first quadrant. So we'd anticipate that the dot product is going to decrease with this example. The reason for that is because theta is no longer zero. And on top of that, are they perfectly parallel aligned? Not quite. So it's not going to have its full potential of being completely aligned, but it'll be for the most part, uh, there's a decent portion of that uh, projection that goes down. Same way with the cross product. So, and then the other way I'll do it, and um, if I write down here, can you guys see that in the third row? Yeah. Okay. The other case is now if we have orthogonal vectors, so if that's U and if that's V, and that forms a right angle, so now what's our theta? In radians, please. And so now, if we take a look at the dot product, we're going to have u dot v is equal to u, well, magnitude u, magnitude v. Now, what's the cosine of pi halves? Zero. Interesting. So we multiply this by zero. So zero times a number, a number times zero, zero. Is that really that surprising? Super surprising. Okay. <laughs> now the level, how parallel are these two vectors? Not Is there any extent of being parallel at all? Not even close. Yeah, no, there's zero measure of being parallel, which is why the dot product is going to be zero. Do you see what I'm trying to get you to think like here? So this is really the concept behind these products that you don't really get to see in physics because you're too busy doing triangles and trusses and ropes and forces. So the magnitude of the cross product, on the other hand, is we're going to have magnitude u, magnitude v. What's sine? Oh, so now they switch spots. And does that make sense? Well, how orthogonal are these two vectors? Maximal orthogonal. Yeah, they're perfectly orthogonal. <laughs> that measure of orthogonality is maximized. So that is the maximum possible value you're going to get. So everyone following along the story here. That's the that's the concept. This is dot products, magnitudes of cross products. Now, there is um, a misconception that can arise when you see it this parallel. So I want to address that. U dot V. And as a, as a personal aside, I'll interrupt myself. Notice how I don't put arrows over these zeros. You, why is that? Yeah, they're just scalars. They're not vectors. And this is going to be a big difference between dot product and cross products. That is very important to get straight. U dot V is a scalar. This means that whatever U dot V is, is a number that is a member of the set of reals. So it's just a constant number to scalar. Thumbs up if you can read that notation. You see what I'm saying with that. So if you see in R, that is how we say in English, basically, or understand it to be a scalar. And then the now the, the difference is I'm not going to put magnitude bars around the cross product. I'm going to leave the cross product as it is. So this product in itself is a vector. And the way we can communicate that is I'll say is an R. N, because now vectors have, we can do the components. It's going to have multiple dimensions to it. So, and then specifically N is going to be greater than one. Otherwise, we would just have R. So that would be redundant. So this would be a vector. Okay. So, dot product is a scalar, cross product is a vector. So class, what is a dot product going to give you? And what is a cross product going to give you? Okay. 
One more time with, again, that Southern Baptist conviction. Dot Products is going to give you a? Sailor. Cross Products is going to give you a? Vector. Excellent. Christy. Yes, actually. <laughs> so what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to confuse these two things. I don't want you to say that U cross V is somehow the same thing as its magnitude. Okay, these are very different things. No, don't do that. Okay? Do not conflate cross products with its magnitude. Because if a cross product is a vector, then it has two components, right? And what are those two different What? Magnitude and direction. Right, magnitude and direction. Does this have a direction? Yes. No. 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 no, it's a scalar. So the scalar is not going to have a direction. Is the cross product going to have a direction? Yes. Okay. And I'll give you a heads up, a little bit of a foreshadowing for tomorrow's lesson. The direction of this vector will be the direction orthogonal to both of these simultaneously. Okay. Yes. What's the point of putting the arrows above you and leave their standard? Ah, very good question. These are actually vectors. The dot product, as well, I'll show you the computational formulas, will result in taking the components of the vectors, and then the components are scalars. So that's how we're getting a scalar out of this dot product. Cross product is going to be different. You'll talk about that tomorrow. But does that, does that address, does that make sense? Because that's why it's important to put the vectors over the arrow, the arrow symbols over these vectors, because we are specifying that these are vectors. Individually. Yeah, individually. But then the components will, you'll form a scalar out of that product. Any questions about what's on the board right now? So the multiplication sign between the scalar and the vector, is that the important of this implementation? So the dot product is the dot. The yes. The dot and the x, this subtly matters. If you put a dot between vectors, everyone's going to read that as a dot product, which is a very, very different thing than a cross product. So again, just how I'm going to be picky about notation of the vectors, I'm going to be picky about the way you do multiplication. Now, if if it's your, if you're just doing like algebra and you're rearranging like an equation or something and it's all scalars, you don't really, we don't, you know, there comes a point when you stop using a symbol for multiplication. So it's like, instead of saying x times y, you would just say x, y. So that's kind of how we distinguish that in Calc 3, because we have a bunch of different kinds of multiplication now. We have scalar multiplication. We have, if there are vectors involved and there's a dot, it's a dot product. If there are vectors involved and it's a x, it's cross product. Sure. So if we have um, a vector and we want to write it as, or say the magnitude, I know you mentioned, you first write the vector sign, then the magnitude, well, can we just write the letter on its own for referring to the magnitude? Mm, very good question. The reason we can't do that is because there's multiple components. So then what are you really referring to? So the reason why we use the arrow instead of just, um, or at least using the absolute value bars to specify magnitude instead of taking off the arrow is because sometimes we run out of symbols. So we want to have the letters that don't have the arrows to just be a regular scalar variable without that immediately implying that it must be the magnitude of some sort of vector. Because the moment you do that, suddenly I'm like, oh wait, is, are these vectors then that I'm taking the magnitudes of? And that's not always going to be the case. That's a good question. All right, anything else? Now we can get to the computation, the part that you guys are probably more interested in. And just so that you guys have the ability to mark this in your notebooks before I'm done erasing, this kind of stuff is going to be on the first exam, whatever we're about to cover next. So the reason for that is it's also going to just be a concept that you do for the rest of the class. So if you can't take a dot product, then uh, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Now we're going to do computational forms of these components. So let's do some review. If I say, let u and v be in R2, do you know how to then express this in terms of components? What do you? U1 and U2. Well, yeah, you can use that. I'm going to use U1 and U2. Cool. But if you said X1, Y2, it, that's fine. Um, and then V is? How did you guys know that there's only two components? 
Okay, so the way that you compute this is technically, if you know the angle between them, you could use the previous formula because you would just slam it through. But if you have the component form, this is way, way easier than trying to find that angle. And now u dot v can simply be done. We buddy up the components. And the components are going to go together. So u1 is going to go together with v1. What do you think is going to happen if we add the next pair? Let's get that u2 together with v2. So this is how we get a scalar. Because notice, sure, this is a vector, but its components are just scalars. And the actual product is defined as just a bunch of scalars interacting with each other. So this will end up as a scalar. So whenever you see u dot v, I know it looks like a mess of symbols, but you have to convince your brain that you're just looking at a number, mm -hmm. just some sort of a constant. And if you can get past that psychological you know, hurdle of associating, don't marry yourself to the symbols, but marry yourself to the idea. And so the idea is that this is just a number. Okay, now we can extend it like we did on Friday. So if u and v are in R3, I have no doubt that this is not too difficult to expand. So then how do we do u? u1, u2, u3. Yes, u1, u2, and u3. And then v is going to be what? You will get to the three. Good. So, when you're doing mathematics on your own and it gives you information like this, you do have permission to use critical thinking because you're adults now. So, you can start putting these things together. Okay. That, that's really only the difference between basic, like high school math, and college math. Because college math is now going to make you fill in more of those gaps that were normally provided for you. But you can do it. Just follow the rules, right? So, now. Does the thought product concept suddenly change if we increase the number of products? No, no, no. no. Okay. So just by knowing this behavior, you already know the pattern, really, to extending this to three dimensions. So what is, how do we compute this? Um, yeah, so U1 goes with what? B1. And then what, what happens in between? Plus. Plus. Yes, we add them all together. And then U2 is going to go with what? V2. What operation? Plus. Plus. Yeah, add them all together. U3. Then V3. So if we had a 100-dimensional vector, you could do this. Just 100 times, you'd have to multiply it out, but it's possible. So raise your hand if you're computer science. A. So that's kind of what you do. It's a little bit of foreshadowing to linear algebra when you expand some of this stuff. Okay, so let's actually generalize the dot product. I'm doing this as a mental exercise for when you're doing your own problems, and you'll be able to know what's going on. So u and v are, and, and then everyone taps out because that's not a number. Okay, but n is a number. It's just not necessarily locked down and committed to being something specific. So we can then say that u... Do you guys know what to do here? There's a you want to you two three 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 right. Indicate that we don't know how many, but yeah. that's okay because we'll stop at the end point. And then V is going to be what? V1. V1. V2. Excellent. Now, just because we're general, did that change the concept of dot product? No. no. So we can anticipate this behavior to be preserved, where we pair up everything with everything. Okay. So u dot v in its general form is well, we start with u one multiplied with the v one, like usual, and u two v two plus all the way up until we get to u and v n. Now, that's kind of ugly, and that's a lot of symbols. And so one way we can do this, this looks like a summation. There's a lot of parallel structure here. So what we could do is instead just express this as a sum from i equals to what's going to be here and what's going to go up top? 1, 2, n. And what's going to go here? With, so ui with what? Bi. 
very good. There you go. So now you know how to compute any dot product that is given to you in any component form in any dimension. Good? Yes. OK. There are three applications that I want to go make sure you have, uh, because I know that lots of problems and the kinds of reasons that Calc3 is going to be useful to you in your future engineering stuff is contained on this page of my lecture notes. So I'm going to give everybody a second. Give me a thumbs up when you can uh, gotten this on your notes before I erase. And I will, I will wait if you need a second. Wait, the summation, what about the previous terms? Do we have one, two, three, four, that? Uh, oh, you automatically added up that. Yep, you could, you could, you could express this as a sum if you really wanted to, be goofy. Um, you know how there's always people who try to make their like social media profile like unique by putting something ridiculous up there like a emoji or something? <laughs> so you could do that. Here's, here's, here's the math version of doing that to the two-dimensional dot product. You could say i equals one to two of u i v i. And if you felt really zesty on a three dimensional one, <laughs> you could do a sum and you could use some art, really, really obscure Greek letter like c equals one to three <laughs> of u sub c v sub c. So pretentious people, practical people. Pure math majors. <laughs> That's all good. All right, everyone good? Yeah. Okay. I think I might need that up. Wait, do I have room for it? No, I don't have room for it. <laughs> what? What? Not So there are three applications we're going to cover. You should be able to do all three of these things, OK? You should be able to find the angle between two vectors that are given to you, OK? The other thing is you should be able to find the vector that is orthogonal to a given vector. So if you're given a vector, I want to know a vector that's going to be 90 degrees to that. And then lastly, you're going to want to know what an orthogonal projection is. So being able to project another vector onto another one orthogonally. Those are the three things that we're going to work through. Um, the first thing is angle between vectors. So if we're going to have vectors u and v and r3, I will leave it to you to make it make sense that this works in r2 as well. So by showing it to you in r3, you're actually getting the r2 version just extended. So we got to practice something in mathematics. We take definitions, and then we draw conclusions from those definitions. But the reason why it can be difficult is because you'll just skip the definitions because you go straight to the example problems and you think that's where all the help is from. No, it's going to be from those boxes in the textbook that have the definition. If you ever get stuck in general on a certain problem, write down all of the math words in the problem statement. Go to your textbook, look up the definitions. You will almost guaranteed solve the problem just by looking up the correct definition. Okay? That's how math works at this level. Um, you can't rely so much on algorithms anymore. So recall the very definition of that product, right? So u dot v involves theta in some extent, right? Because we have magnitude u, magnitude v, cosine theta. So that's the point of interest, the angle between two vectors that are given a component form. Now, if we have the component form, we just discussed that if this is an R3, how can we actually just hand compute that from its components? You guys remember? U1, 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 U2, 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 U3. Excellent. Two different things that represent exactly the same thing. Maybe that's going to be helpful here. Because now we don't need the middleman. We don't need U dot V because we now have it expressed in terms of scalars and then some scalars. That's what we're interested in. Because now we can isolate theta. So we have u v cosine theta is equal to u1 v1, u2 v2, u3 v3. Does if everybody okay with that jump? Yeah. All we're doing is we're saying that this thing. Okay. Now, if we want to figure out this angle, from here, I already know what you guys know what you need to do. Um, but if you isolate, then you have u1 v1, u2 v2, 
u3 v3, all divided by, now these are magnitudes of vectors. So are that they are the scalars, so we can divide by scalars. And we're gonna recall one more thing. Because the definition might come at you in the form of a concept instead of maybe English words. So magnitude of a component form, we talked about this on Friday, it's okay if you haven't memorized this one yet, but you'll recognize it quickly. U1 squared, U2 squared, everybody. all good? And then, oh, sorry, yeah, thank you. U1 squared, U2 squared. And then for V, it's going to be V1 squared, V2 squared, V3 squared. So, you will know how to find the angle between two vectors that are given their component forms. So, I'm going to have you scratch something out. Actually, no, you have it in the Pearson. There's a Pearson problem like this. So, is it clear what you would do with actual numbers? What? So, like, if you were given... That not just abstract the u and v, but you were given actual numbers like say one, two. Um, would you know how to plug it into like a formula? Yes. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. To some extent, I am assuming that since you are sophomores at, in STEM, that you can do SAT level math skills like substitution. So, um, if you were given actual numbers for u and v, just plug it in, and then when you get to this part. Just plug it in. There are certain assumptions that I have to make. Um, otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere in this class. Okay, are there questions about finding an angle if you're given two vectors with components? So from then you would just uh, do the inverse uh, cosine of that? Uh... Yep, because once you're able to write, the, the real trick is, so long as you really remember this first step, that's where everything falls. If you can recall that you can use the cosine form as well as the scalar expanded form, you're able, you can, you can do whatever you want. You have a lot more freedom and creativity uh, for your problem solving. So yeah, I would emphasize this for sure. This is the most important part. The rest of it is really just consequences of performing the algebra and then isolating um, what you're interested in. Okay. Okay. <laughs> We're going to work on finding a vector that is orthogonal to a vector. So when we were talking about the definition of the dot product, if you take the dot product between two vectors, say I didn't tell you what those were. You just have two vectors, but I tell you that their dot product is zero. What information do you automatically have for free? And why is that? Because the cosine of pi over two is zero. Exactly. And that's well, the only... It has a magnitude of zero, but that doesn't really make any sense. You bring up a good caveat. The zero vector will be orthogonal to all vectors because the dot product of the zero vector with the vector is still zero. So by definition, yes, it is orthogonal to every vector. Um, but if you wanted to find, okay, so find a vector that is orthogonal, so orthogonal to, I'll just use A, so A1, A2, and so just for the sake of getting you familiar with seeing this notation. This vector has two components, so it is a member of R2. All good? Okay, is, so... Is that an A? Like, yes, this is the letter A. These are A's. This is going to force me to practice my handwriting. <laughs> okay, so suppose... We don't know what it is yet, but suppose there's a vector B such that a dot b is zero. So I'm going to say, okay, b is orthogonal to a. Now let's work together what we got to work 
what those components are supposed to be. So what this is saying is that a1, b1 plus a2, b2 needs to be zero. Everybody see that step? Could you have figured intuitive it on your own from the definitions? So do you see how really most of like a mathematical process is the reason we can get from step A to step B is usually you're just citing a definition or a theorem or something like that. So now this is a little harder to see, so I'll show you. But if essentially, if B1 is a2 something, and B2 is related to A1, then these are going to be the same number. And if they have the same magnitude, we understand that in general, X plus the negative version of X is what? Zero. Ah. So we're going to get a slick way of choosing our B1 and B2 with respect to A1 and A2 that will end up basically having something plus the minus version of that length. And that'll always get us back to zero. So we can make B1. Um, Sorry, A1, we can make B1, A2. And if we do that, what should we make B2 so that it's the same kind of number, but then the negative version? Minus A1. Yeah, minus A1. Because now we have A1, A2 plus the negative version of A1, A2. And that's always going to be what? Zero. Ooh, tricky. So then if we're going to recognize the component form of that vector, B here in this case, was a2 minus a1. So a2 minus a1. What is that really saying? That's saying if I want an orthogonal vector, I'm just going to do -si do and then make sure one of them is negative. Now, there's technically another vector that's orthogonal to a here. You guys see it? Two negative a2 a1. Good. We put the negative on A2 and then keep A1 positive because that's going to accomplish the same task here, right? A1, if I multiply by minus A2, and then I have A2 and A1, what does that give? Yeah, it gives me zero. Because this is minus A1, A2, and then regular A1, A2. And that's going to go to zero as well. So we can also have the minus sign on the A2 instead of the A1. Um, will there be any conditions that determine which one you make the negative? Oh, no. no. It's just, if it, so that, it depends on the type of question. So if the question asks for just simply, can you find one of the orthogonal vectors? Mm -hmm. Your choice. If it asks for the set of all the orthogonal vectors, you're going to start to want to include these. And then also, if you're going to do the set of orthogonal vectors, you also need to include this zero vector in that list. So to every vector in R2, there are going to be three vectors that are orthogonal to it. And that should make intuitive sense in the plane. Here is a plane, and here is a vector. So to be orthogonal, I could go orthogonal in this direction, right? I could also go orthogonal in this direction. but Who's to say the length of this vector actually matters? It's still, the angle is the same. So any scalar multiple of this is still going to be orthogonal, and any scalar multiple in this direction is going to be. So a whole nine forms. So you get an infinite number of possible ways you could describe a vector that's orthogonal to any given vector. So graphically, that's what's going on. And I'll leave it to you to muse over what happens the moment you stick this in three dimensions. Any questions about this? Okay, then I have a question for you. If this was, say, in three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. Ooh, three dimensions, okay. <laughs> How many, so yes, along this line in a plane is orthogonal. But what do you actually end up getting in three dimensions of all of the vectors that could be? Orthogonal to that. Fully because if you imagine, have you guys have you guys had a kebab before? Yeah. Okay. So think of this as like the stick, and if you spin that stick, it's all going to swirl around, right? But it doesn't change the angle perspective to anything. So if I was to basically take this little vector and then like spin it between my fingers and watch this line sweep around in a circle, 
you're going to sweep out a whole plane. You're going to sweep out the plane that is specifically at that slant. And so there's your little foreshadowing for how we define planes in three-dimensional space. It's related to, you can, you can designate an entire plane just based off of one vector. Ooh. Yeah. So you could argue that's what people who come up with this need to touch grass, or it's really cool. So um, orthogonal projections is the one thing that we're going to spend a little bit more time on because it's a little bit harder. But I like to say, if it's a little harder, that means you just have to convince yourself it's easier, and then that counteracts it. So. <laughs> the way I'm going to present this to you is in a way that I want you to internalize as uh, re-deriving the idea. Because more important than the formulas, the formula is actually going to be less helpful than knowing where it's coming from. That's a general pattern I've noticed with the Pearson problems, is that they'll memorize the formulas, and they'll be like, I got the formulas. Why isn't it helpful? And it's usually because they just didn't take the time to see where any of this is coming from. So all of you are going to get some paper, and you're all going to derive the projection formula with me, OK? We need to start with two vectors so, so that we're all using the same frame of reference. Here's you, and then here's me. And then you can you know, denote that theta is going to be a, that angle between them. The way we're doing this, since we're driving this together, I'm going to need a thumbs up every time we finish a step, okay? Okay. Now, what is a projection? Well, a projection of you onto B is kind of think about that visually. What kind of, how far is you going along that direction of B? So what you're going to do is everyone take go to the head of V, or sorry, head of U and drop it until it's perpendicular with V. Mark that as right angle. And then when we talk about a projection, what we're really talking about is this vector right here. The vector that starts here and ends right at the base of this triangle. So this is what we are talking about when we talk about the projection vector of u onto v. That's what this is like. So whenever you see that, it's referring to this geometric. So before we move on, is everyone clear on who our character is in this little story? Okay, it's going to be this little vector, this one there, there. So you've all taken some level of physics, or if not physics, trigonometry. So the component, we can find that with the magnitude of this vector, and then that's the adjacent. So this is cosine, right? So we know that the magnitude of this, so if projection uv is a vector, that means there's two things. What are those two things that we need for every single vector? Projection and, and magnitude. So let's start with the magnitude. The magnitude is going to be that cosine component in this right triangle. So it's going to be u times the cosine of the angle between them. Can everybody see that from the picture? Because if you can see it, if you can make sense, if you can make that make sense to yourself, then that's pretty much the most work right there. And then the other part of this being a vector is that we need a direction. Now, when we multiply this, we want just the direction. We don't care about the length. So we're going to take the unit vector so that we preserve the direction without changing the value of the magnitude. So it's v, and the way we get to a unit vector is u divide by its own magnitude. You remember that from Friday? Mm -hmm. Okay. So is it really a mystery if the way that this vector is defined is its magnitude scaled in the correct direction? And we call 
the magnitude, another word we give for this specific instance is scale, the scalar part. So SCAL of U to V is going to specifically refer to this magnitude. It's not a different concept. It's just, in my opinion, an awkward way to communicate that this is the magnitude of this weapon. And this right here is the direction. Effectively, we've multiplied the magnitude by one, but we've pointed it in the right direction. So multiplying the magnitude by one, is that going to change your magnitude? Mm -hmm. No. So that it's still the correct length, but now it's going in that direction to be. And in general, that's how you can get, so if there's a certain question that might ask like, hey, here's a vector. I want you to find a vector that is exactly seven and a half long, but pointing in this specific direction. Okay, we'll find the unit vector and then just scale it up however much you want it. And that is the general kind of concept for, for manipulating and, and creating vectors that you want. You have the freedom to do that. All good so far with this definition. Because mm -hmm. it's a vector. So if you if you get it out of your head that this is somehow some random different calculus three thing, and if you think of this as just a way to express a vector with ridiculously clumsy notation, you're on the way to success. So a projection is just a vector. Got it? Yeah. So what is a projection? A vector. And a vector has what? Two parts. Magnitude and direction. Right. So you can always put this together. You're not going to remember U magnitude of u cosine theta v over magnitude of v, but you will remember this. And then as soon as you see this, you'll be like, oh, that's the vector I'm talking about. Boom, it's there. You see how I'm trying to get you to think. Mm -hmm. By the time you're done with Calc 3, you're not going to remember all the formulas. This is my third time teaching this. I don't even remember all the formulas, but I do remember this. Because I remember this, I can get there. OK. So. There is a, this is honestly not a very nice form to have the definition in, because that's really difficult to compute. You get, there's information about the angle. You can't always get that information. And then you also need to have your two vectors. So we find easier ways to do this. So I want you to recognize something. Recall, what's the definition of the dot product again? Magnitude u, magnitude v. Because, um, so magnitude u, magnitude v, cosine theta. cosine theta. Now, why would I ever be interested in this with respect to the, the projection? Because it's very similar. There are similar parts. Now, what's this missing? Magnitude v. Okay. So let's divide that from both sides and see what happens, right? So if I divide both sides by that magnitude of v, I'm going to have u dot v over the magnitude of v. And that is going to be, oh my goodness, u and then cosine theta. Ah, well, that looks a little familiar, does it? Because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's the scalar part. OK. Now, there's another thing that we didn't really have time to talk about because it's a little bit easy. But if you take a vector, and you take a dot product with itself. Hmm. Interesting, right? Because now the components are exactly the same. So when you do v1, v1, and v2, v2, now we know for certain that those are the same number. So we can call that a square. So this is now v1 squared and v2 squared. Everybody good with that? Yeah. But wasn't the definition of the magnitude of a vector v the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared. So how are these things related? What's the only difference? The square root. Yeah. So how would you get rid of the square root here? Square root. Yeah, square both sides. So this is actually not the magnitude, but it's the magnitude squared. Does that line of reasoning work for you guys? Yeah. Excellent. With these two tools, we're now going to derive this formula that I conveniently put on my arm to remember. Mm -hmm. I'll do this. Everybody got this? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Because this is basically this is all the hardware. As soon as as soon as I erase the top here, you're gonna see it all put together. Mm -hmm. Okay, am I good to erase the top like 
portion of the board. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we are going to derive a better formula for projection. So the projection, U to B, we need to start with what we knew. So geometrically, all we know so far is I need that magnitude from trigonometry. So there's my magnitude. If I drop it down, that's just that U boson data. And I need to point this in the right direction by hitting this unit vector here. OK, but now that I have this, let's start to use the tools that we put together. So if U cosine theta is actually this, I'm going to take this and substitute it with this. Is that okay with everybody? If I put the u dot v over the magnitude of v, which is coming from right here, because we knew the definition of the dot product, that's going to replace having to put the trig, in, trig function in there. And so now we have still the unit vector. Thumbs up if that substitution works. You can make it make sense to yourself. Okay, here's where it's going to be really important to test whether you still understand that scalars are not vectors and vectors are not scalars. So, dot product, what's that? Good. V. Magnitude V. Scalar. Magnitude V. Scalar. Good. So, these are scalars and that's a scalar. We can put the scalars all together. Okay. So, we have U dot V, which don't call those vectors, it's a scalar, over if we take the magnitude of v times the magnitude of v, that's a scalar times itself. So we can tell that the magnitude of v squared. Mm -hmm. And then all that's left is now the vector component, right? So the vector side. So that's the only part of this that's a vector. It's the only part of this that has a direction. The rest of that is just scalars, numbers. So does, that, does that step work? Everyone can see it? Yes. I'm sure it's probably not rocket science where this is going because we just did the this is right here. And now that's just the dot product of view itself. So we have the dot product U and V over what dot product? Yep. V with itself. And then there's the direction portion. That is what I wrote on my. And this is going to be far easier to compute than this. What is the difference? primarily in terms of convenience for this and this. Yeah, don't need to know theta. So in this formula, you not only need to know what U and V are, but then you need the angle between them, mm -hmm. which is fine if you're given it. But this, you only need U and V. So why do more work when you could do less work? Aristotle, probably. <laughs> so there is, um, let's see, scalar. Did that one with that. Okay. It's one. Great. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one person from each row come on up here. Should I do this um, like a dictator or dem democratically? <laughs> okay. So, Danny, Bella, uh, Rebecca, I have yet to memorize your name up there. I want to see communism. Do you get them? Guys, focus up. Danny is going to give us the setup. So you're going to draw the geometric motivation for projection vector. speak to us. Oh, so we have vector u, which is at an angle, and vector v, which is flat on the x-axis. I don't know if that's particularly relevant. Angle theta v between them. And this is going to be the projection of the length of u across uh, v. So that is the projection of u onto v. Is that the correct word? Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, Rebecca. 
Go ahead and give me, tell, teach everybody, what are the two components of that projection vector that we're interested in? <laughs> Class, help her out. What are the two things in the vector? Direct, 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 direct. All right. So let's start with the magnitude. What's the magnitude? Magnitude of this one by trigonometry will be the magnitude of u cosine of theta. Excellent. Go ahead and write that. I am too blind for this. Is it possible to make it a little bit bigger, Andrea? Sure. Sorry. I have a tendency to write tiny yeah. anyway, so. And I have a tendency to write sloppy, so we all have our mm -hmm. all of Perfect. And then what's the direction? And then the direction is in the direction of V, so you would use the unit vector of V to ensure it's going the same direction. Fantastic. What's how you write this? Represent that. It is vector of v over magnitude of v. Awesome. Okay. That one. Run um, them for clarity. Right? <laughs> they're being multiplied. Go ahead and show us how to get rid of the trigonometric function through the definition of dot products. Mm -hmm. Take it on the marker. She doesn't like the French. Mines. Why? Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about. Explain to them what you've done. Okay, that's the dot product formula. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to get rid of this, I think. Well, why would you get rid of it? Because it's not here. Fantastic. So what did that look like? Class? Okay. What do you think needs to happen to the right side to get it to look the same? Divide by the magnitude of that given. Perfect. Okay, and then Kutanda. How do we get, um, how are we going to use the magnitude of that squared? So go ahead and take the dot product of V with itself. Dot product of V with itself. So do V dot V and then simplify it. Okay, so class, what two things, what's he going to need to take the dot product? And that scale as well. Your components, so V1 is V2. Huh? Yeah. So V1 is going to be multiplied by what? V1. 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 Okay. So V1, V1. And then you add V2. Perfect. Okay. And now, if you have the same number, you can just write it this way. And then, what is this with respect to the magnitude of that? Magnitude squared. Just by going one. The magnitude squared. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Now, of the four of you, who wants to put it all together? Okay. All right, so from here, we'll take this and replace over here. So then we get the dot product of U and V over the magnitude of V, replacing magnitude of U cosine theta multiplied by vector V over the magnitude of vector V. Then this is a scalar, scalar, scalar. This is a vector. So we can multiply our scalar in. So then we get the dot product over the magnitude of vector V squared, which we know is the dot product of V and V. So then we get this times vector V, and then we can replace the magnitude of vector v squared with the dot product of vector v and vector v. 
You want to write it? Everybody good. All right, give these guys a hand. All right, so you guys have readings due. I want you to have read 13.3 and 13.4 before tomorrow, okay? 13.4 is cross product. We've already talked about some cross products, but you'll be fleshing out how to compute a cross product tomorrow. There is a different classroom for Tuesday. It's going to be... Uh, I'm pretty sure two A of two. Yeah. For the projection, yes. So you'll want to know all of those pieces for the for example. Cool. All right. Have fun physics, guys. Yes.